Hello, I'm Richard Hirsch, Professor of History at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. This talk is titled, Rethinking Rural Electrification, an Alternative Narrative for Understanding How Farmers Obtained Power in the Early 20th Century. The germ for this work came from an experience I had in 1979 when I visited a small general store in Backwoods, Florida, in which the owner sat in front of a framed picture of President Franklin Roosevelt. When I asked her why she kept this picture on the wall rather than that of then President Jimmy Carter, she told me with gravitas in her voice that Roosevelt brought electricity to her community. The story resonated with me because I had learned in high school and in college the history of rural electrification in which big government brought power to the thankful farmers. Arthur Schlesinger in one of his classic books wrote, where farm life had been so recently drab, dark and backbreaking, it now received in a miraculous decade a new access of energy, cleanliness and light. No single agency, the Rural Electrification Administration, ever so enriched and brightened the quality of rural living. Here's another example of the traditional praise for the REA from William Luchtenberg. Perhaps no single act of the Roosevelt years changed more directly the way people lived than the president's creation of the Rural Electrification Administration in May 1935. Nine out of 10 American farms had no electricity. The lack of electric power divided the US into two nations, the city dwellers and the country. More recently, in this easy to read popular history of the US written in 2013, we see similar praise of the government. The electric power was there ready and waiting and straining at the leash to give them, the farmers, relief and hope. But in the 1930s, the chiefs of the utility giants judged it as being too costly to bring to their doorsteps. Once elected, FDR acted swiftly to apply government right as he saw it to a monstrous capitalist wrong. And indeed, on further study, I read about the amazing things that electricity did for farmers. I read about how electricity became equated with progress, and I enjoyed looking at the artwork and photographs made by the Depression era make work programs that highlighted the value of electricity. Here we see a photograph noting that the electric wire is a sign of agricultural progress, and we see several photos showing how farmers and family members used electricity so productively and in ways that enhanced farm life. There were even movies made about the wonders of farm electrification, such as the use of electricity to pump water and to provide hot and cold running water. And then there were the startling statistics. I read about the amazing growth and a great story of how the federal government brought progress and modernity to the farmer. Look at these data. 21% per year growth rates in rural electrification nationally, 25% per year in Virginia. It's a wonderful story, powerful and affecting and heartwarming and telling. It makes us want to embrace the federal government and tell it how much we appreciate all it did for us citizens. The only problem with what I just described, the graph showing the great increases in farmers obtaining power and of culturally meaningful photographs, is that they come from the 1920s and early 1930s, well before the REA was formed. When I discovered such historical evidence, I started thinking about the conventional story of rural electrification, and that's what brings us to my talk today. In this talk, I'll discuss rural electrification efforts pursued in the years before the federal government engaged heavily in the nation's political economy and created the REA. Refuting the conventional narrative, my study documents extensive work performed by the utility industry in electrifying rural America during the 1920s. I'll emphasize that most historians have dismissed a discussion of context and culture of utility managers of the time, and that farmers really weren't as backward as some people suggested. Moreover, in parts of the country, the utility industry pursued electrification with gusto and set up projects in conjunction with agricultural engineers at land-grant colleges like Virginia Tech that help us understand those remarkable statistics that I already showed.
Before I get into the full discussion of the topic, let me introduce myself and tell you a little about myself. I'm somewhat of a strange bird having a background in physics and history. I've written a lot about and talked about energy policy, especially energy and electricity policy in contemporary times, and I've worked with people in many disciplines around campus and elsewhere. I somewhat accidentally got involved in this current research and writing on rural electrification in the Commonwealth of Virginia when I discovered files in our library dealing with Virginia Tech's efforts to spur farm electrification in the years before the Great Depression. Those efforts were pursued by agricultural engineers and people working with the Agricultural Extension Service. The traditional narrative often starts and ends with a discussion of how utility people looked simply at economics and largely wrote off farmers. I suggest that this rationale, though not untrue, isn't the entire story of why utilities neglected farmers. It cost a lot of money to serve farmers who were very sparsely settled. In 1923 Wisconsin, for example, there were about two to three customers per mile in rural areas, and that compared to 40 to 300 hundred per mile in towns and cities. And if you consider that the cost of the distribution lines was somewhere between $1,500 and $2,500 per mile, clearly it was kind of uneconomic to serve those farmers. Beyond that, there was sort of this chicken and egg story. Farmers needed to use more power and make it profitable for utilities before they could get service. But without first getting electricity, how could farmers learn about new ways to make productivity gains with electricity? But economic reasoning only partially accounts for managers' reluctance to energize rural districts, though standard histories give it the most explanatory power. My research demonstrates that many city-based businessmen held condescending views toward farmers, thinking of them as independent rural folk who resisted efforts for improvement offered by business and educational experts. Here we have one utility manager uh, stating at a national meeting. The farmer has shown little ingenuity in working out his own salvation and has been inclined to rely upon the government and special legislation for relief. These condescending attitudes developed at a time when business people and engineers showed their might in the industrial world. Early in the 20th century, People like Henry Ford started producing literally millions of Model T cars. And engineer Herbert Hoover, for example, showed how important engineers could be and how useful they could be when he helped manage the food relief efforts for Belgium and other parts of Europe at the beginning of World War I. These were heroes at the time. They were engineers, they were business people. They certainly weren't like those lowly farmers. These condescending attitudes were being created also at a tough time for farmers. The country suffered through a huge recession in 1920 and 21, but while the general business sector recovered and thrived during the 20s, farmers did not. By the end of the decade and before the Great Depression struck, farmers were still only pulling in about 68% of the income they received at their post-World War I peak. Because of the tough times suffered by the farmers, some people called for subsidies for them and for programs that provided electricity to them at below cost. But that wasn't the way things were done in the years before the New Deal. Herbert Hoover often spoke about socialism in Europe, and he argued that in the United States, we didn't do things like they did in Europe and even in Canada, where governments subsidized farmers and brought them electricity at relatively low cost. In 1924, Hoover noted that socialism may have a place with some of the nations of Europe. It has no place with us. He continued, we have today in America the widest extended and most efficient utility service in the world. We have developed an effective method of controlling abuses. He asked whether we should be told to embrace new social ideas, increase our cost of service, decrease our national efficiency, undermine our democracy, and destroy the fundamentals upon which our nation has become great. This is not progressive, for it is not progress, he said. It is destruction.
In short, utility managers shunned farmers' business because it would not prove profitable. But as importantly, and in a way that other historians have largely neglected, they discounted the rural market because they viewed farmers with disdain as backward, unmodern, and unsophisticated. Moreover, in an era that extolled the virtues of free enterprise and individual responsibility, the managers felt no great pressure to achieve goals of social equity or social improvement, nor did they think it equitable to force one group of customers to subsidize others. In the days before the Roosevelt administration altered perceptions of the roles of government and business, such practices just appeared un-American and unworthy of serious consideration. Despite this view of farmers as people who rejected modern approaches to do things, historians such as Ron Klein and Deborah Fitzgerald have demonstrated the opposite. Farmers didn't reject modern technologies, rather they embraced them, but often in forms that differed from how they were used in cities. We see people using automobiles, radios, telephones, and other technologies on the farm, though indeed they used them somewhat differently than people did in the city. And indeed, there were lots of people who even adopted electricity on the farm, though they didn't get that electricity from the central power stations. Here we see an advertisement for electricity that could be produced by a small windmill. Several farmers also took advantage of the water that was running by their farms and built water wheels that could be attached to generators to make electricity for a small farm. Farmers could also take advantage of electric light plants that were designed to be used on individual farms and just by the local owners. This today would be called distributed generation and companies like the Delco Light Company produced three to 400,000 of these light plants for use on farms in the period between about 1916 to 1935 or so. The Delco Light Company was a subsidiary of General Motors, and it took advantage of some of the automakers' techniques for making mass-produced products, such that the Delco Light generation set was very well made, very efficient, and relatively low cost. The company also advertised heavily, often suggesting that when farmers had electricity in their home, it would help keep the kids from moving into the cities, which were much more exciting, partly because of all the electrical appliances and electric lights and entertainment activities that were powered by electricity. The advertisement on the right notes that the road to health and happiness is found in making the home modern and up to date. Bright, safe, convenient Delco Light conserves the health of every member of the family and makes better, happier homes. It's the way of progress. Here's another advertisement from the Delco Light Company in which the company is trying to emphasize that there's a lot of value to electricity, especially in the house where the woman does a lot of work too. The picture on the left seems like it shows the dreary life of farm women, but in fact these women were using an electrically powered washing machine. If you look closely you can see a Delco generating set on the left of the picture, and behind the women you can see some batteries that were used to store electricity such that the generator didn't have to operate continuously to provide electricity for the farmstead. The text on the right says the vacuum cleaner and wall cleaning attachment make house cleaning a pleasure. Well, obviously a man wrote that text. It was from a master's degree thesis in agricultural engineering dealing with electricity on the farm and these Delco sets. A federal survey in 1930 showed that about 4% of farmers in the nation had isolated power plants like this Delco generating set. Another 10% or so received electricity from power plants in cities. The power was distributed to the farmers by distribution lines. The power plants themselves were located usually in cities or in towns.
And while many utility people did not see much potential in the farm market, requiring farmers to buy isolated power plants like the Delco sets if they wanted electricity, other managers actually pursued the farm market aggressively. That was especially the case in western states, where farmers were using electric pumps for irrigation purposes. In states such as California, Washington, and Utah, farmers and utilities worked together to boost electrical sales to farmers, and everyone benefited. And here you see an article from 1920 suggesting that western farmers found irrigation to be a wonderful use of electricity, and the electric power companies were very happy to sell electricity to them. In 1923, already almost 24% of California farms had electricity. Washington saw about 18% electrified, and Utah had about 13% of its farms electrified. The national average in 1923 for farm electrification was just under 3%. While it may seem obvious today that electricity on the farm would make good economic sense to all parties, this statement of fact had not yet been established in the early 1920s, despite what historians and advocates of the Rural Electrification Administration claimed. At the time, it appeared that the benefits would remain largely one-sided, with utility companies concerned that farmers would not use enough power to make it worth their while to serve them, of course with exceptions for irrigation farmers in the West. The goal then was to boost farmers' use of power and show how farmers could use electricity in ways that would benefit themselves and the utilities. And while most electric utility managers didn't think much about the farm market, there were some managers who caught the attention of others and were able to create something called the Committee on the Relation of Electricity to Agriculture, the CREA, within the electric utility industry. And what they did then was to set up about 25 state committees that were headed by agricultural engineers at land-grant colleges. Most people watching this presentation don't need a little primer on what land-grant colleges were, but let me just briefly describe them. In 1862, the Morrill Land-Grant Act was passed. It enabled the sale of federal land to support schools for non-elite students who studied agriculture and the mechanical arts. Some of those schools included Virginia Agriculture and Mechanical College, later known as Virginia Polytechnic Institute, and now commonly known as Virginia Tech. North Carolina State University, University of Wisconsin, University of Minnesota, Penn State, and a bunch of other colleges, at least one in each state, were established as land-grant colleges. Further legislation in 1887, in particular the Hatch Act, created funding for agricultural experiment stations and agricultural research at the land-grant schools. And in 1914, Congress passed the Smith-Lever Act, which provided funding for extension agents so that the knowledge that came out of the land-grant colleges could be spread to people in every county of each state. The CREA smartly leveraged the value of its work by partnering with these land-grant agricultural engineers. The agricultural engineers were a newly specialized type of engineers who became professionalized a decade or so earlier with the formation of the American Society of Agricultural Engineers. And many of these people started departments of agricultural engineering in schools such as VPI. At Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Charles Seitz became a prominent agricultural engineer, and he also was the head of the American Society of Agricultural Engineers. In 1924, as I'll mention in a moment, he became the head of Virginia's Committee on the Relationship of Electricity to Agriculture. The first state committee was set up in Minnesota where it was managed by Earl Stewart, an agricultural engineer at the University of Minnesota. 
They did an experiment there in which they electrified 16 farms, provided plenty of assistance and education to let people know how to use electricity on farms efficiently in ways that would yield very nice profits for the farmers. At the same time, they encouraged the farmers to use more and more electricity such that the local utility would be willing to sell electricity to them and pay for the distribution lines that went from the power plants to the farms. Overall, after a period of about four or five years, the farmers recorded huge increases in income, productivity, and they also watched the cost of electricity decline as they used more and more of it. It seemed like quite a success for the first real experiment on electrification on farms. The Virginia Committee was set up in 1924 with Charles Seitz as its head. Like in Minnesota, the committee did an experiment in which it electrified a few farms, in this case near Richmond, and studied how the farmers used electricity and how they could improve their lives by using more and more electricity in different ways. In one of the Virginia Polytechnic Institute experiments, researchers separated a hen house in two and illuminated half the hens with electric lights and the other half with just natural daylight. The result was startling. The electrically illuminated hens produced 45% more eggs, yielding a profit of $270. That $270 exceeded the expenses to wire the barn alone, and it enabled the farmer to make more money in following years. Altogether, about 25 states set up these committees on the relation of electricity to agriculture. Here are some of the letterheads and a publication uh, from the Oregon Committee in 1926. The Kansas Committee had this great letterhead, I thought, uh, because it shows the central power station as a backdrop for the modern electric farm. The state committees, in conjunction with the land-grant agricultural engineers and the extension service agents, use the infrastructure at hand to teach farmers about new uses of electricity. They often did these at short courses held at many states many times after around 1928. You can see in the left of the slide here, a brochure for the first annual Rural Electrification Short Course at Virginia Polytechnic Institute in 1929. Many of these short courses had special classes for women so that the women could learn how to use some of the new electrified appliances like electric stoves. Agricultural engineers and the state committees helped establish the value of electricity on the farm at a time when people were, quite frankly, not convinced that electricity could do a lot on the farm that would benefit both the farmers and the utility companies. For example, in 1925, the Washington State Land Grant Agricultural Engineering Professor could only identify 35 uses of electricity that would benefit farmers in its demonstrable and profitable manner. Because of the work done by the state committee, by 1932, that number had risen to 160. Moreover, with the short courses, research, and publications, ag engineers helped bridge the technical and cultural gap between farmers and utility people. As noted, they did controlled experiments. In other examples of such experiments, they demonstrated that electric incubation of chicken eggs saved labor and yielded higher rates of hatching and with much lower fire risk than when using kerosene heaters. And the short courses brought farmers and utility people together to breed greater trust and cooperation. At the same time, the agricultural engineering departments developed courses that increasingly dealt with rural electrification, and they trained people to understand the needs of both the farmers and the utility companies. At VPI, ag engineer Charles Seitz reported to President Burris in 1929 that his department was training more and more people to work with the leading utilities in the state, which contributed to a more than tripling of the farm customers in just two years.
Overall, the state committees, the ag engineers, extension agents, and utility companies themselves did much to spur farm electrification in the 1920s and until the end of 1931, as these numbers testify. Overall in the United States, farm electrification increased from just under 3% at the end of 1923 to about 11% by the end of 1931, a growth rate of about 36% per year, as I noted earlier. Another 4% were served by isolated or individual power plants, like the Delco light plants or by wind or water powered generators. This map shows the great variation in electrification around the country. You'll see that most of the growth in electrification occurred in the western states where irrigation was a big thing and where electric power companies sold lots of powers to farmers who used irrigation. It's also worth noting that in southern states, where farmers were mostly tenants and did not own their own land or equipment, electrification lagged dramatically. Mississippi, for example, saw less than 1% of its farms electrified before 1935. Based on my work so far, I think it's fair to say that I found enough evidence that challenges the traditional narrative of rural electrification. The growth of electrification was quite significant in the 1920s, despite managers' contempt for farmers and economic crises that farmers suffered in the period between around 1921 to 1930, there was still an almost quadrupling of farms that got electricity by the early 1930s. All this work also was done within the context of a laissez-faire government. There was no sense that private businesses should subsidize farmers or or perform social goods, nor was it viewed as a government obligation to provide electricity to farmers or anyone else. Moreover, when mutual benefits existed in terms of farmers and utilities profiting from extensive power use, utilities happily supplied electricity, as was the case in the West where farmers used a lot of electricity for irrigation, and both farmers and utilities profited nicely from the sale of that electricity. My account further challenges the traditional narrative because it highlights the work of the state committees, which demonstrates that some utility people indeed sought to help create a better market for electricity on farms. The standard histories of rural electrification that address the state committees generally dismiss them, but my investigation into the records at state land-grant schools show that they did a lot to demonstrate the value of electricity to farmers and to encourage them to use enough power to make their farms attractive to the utility companies as customers. Finally, I argue that the state committees on the relation of electricity to agriculture made effective use of the agricultural engineers at land-grant colleges to help bridge the cultural and technical gap between utilities and farmers. I like to tell students that they should write papers that offer some value to people who couldn't care less about their topic. In this case, I hope that many of you may appreciate one methodological insight I've gained, even if it's not 100% original. The problem in telling the early story of rural electrification stems, in part at least, because we know how successful the government's REA was in bringing power to the previously unserved. In contrast to the electrification efforts from 1935 through the 1950s and later, the work in the 1920s may not seem impressive, with only 10% of all farmers getting electricity by 1930 or so. But it only appears mediocre because of the unfair comparison with events that historians know occurred later. When we tell other stories, we deliberately try to avoid allowing our knowledge of what happened later to influence our discussion of earlier time periods, though avoiding that approach seems to have been missed when discussing rural electrification. I agree that the story of the REA's electrification efforts is affecting, serving as an example of how the federal government, during a dark period in American history, took bold action that had long-lasting and positive impacts. But I'm arguing instead that we look at events in the 1920s in a broader context, in a period of exuberance about the potential and real benefits that corporate engineers could offer the world.
Moreover, the political environment of the day dismissed government intervention in the market since people believed that the challenges of a society could effectively be met through the action of modern corporations. In an era of laissez-faire government and a disenchantment of socialistic approaches that European and Canadian governments employed, elite engineers and business people saw rural electrification using methods that made sense at the time. We must be careful not to write history based on what we know occurred later, such as the introduction of big government approaches to deal with the economic and social calamities of the Great Depression. Let me end by asking why I think a refutation of the conventional narrative is necessary in the first place. Put differently, why has the traditional story remained so popular? Clearly, the New Deal account of rural electrification is wonderful, partly because it embodies great and colorful actors. It includes people like Samuel Insel, the head of a number of large utility companies, and who was viewed as a hero in the 1920s for using some of his immense wealth to support the Chicago Opera and other cultural enterprises. He even graced the cover of Time magazine in 1926. But after the stock market crash in 1929, some of his companies went bankrupt, and he was tried, though acquitted, in federal court for fraud. Meanwhile, Franklin Roosevelt campaigned against people like Insel, who he argued had exploited the financial system and contributed to the woes of millions of people during the Depression. Insel and the utility industry in general went from being viewed positively in the 1920s to being portrayed as villains in the 1930s, while FDR was seen as a savior who, among other things, finally brought electricity to rural Americans. It was a great story indeed. And indeed, the REA did amazing things, spurring farmers themselves and investor-owned utility companies to electrify the farms very quickly. By 1950, about 80% of all farms in America had central station electricity. By 1960, that number had pushed well above 90%. In short, I offer a different way of looking at rural electrification, one that provides more nuance and understanding of the context of events before the federal government became a big player in the political economy. Moreover, I like to think that my work demonstrates the contingent nature of creating the electric power system in the United States. It does so by identifying previously unrecognized actors, especially agricultural engineering professors at the land-grant schools and the Committee on the Relation of Electricity to Agriculture, along with their state affiliates. We see that, had the government REA not been created, farm communities would still have received electrical service, though perhaps not as quickly. In other words, while many people have come to accept the traditional textbook narrative that suggested that only the government could have electrified farms, I argue that an alternative approach for rural electrification had already been established. Let me note as a last thought that I am not an apologist for utility companies. Still, it seems like bad history to compare the rural electrification work of the late 1930s through the 1950s to the efforts undertaken before the Depression. And even if you do just look at the 1920s, one sees a lot more nuance, complexity, and progress than what is generally described in the standard histories of rural electrification. Thank you for your attention. If you'd like more information on this topic, feel free to contact me at the email address listed. Goodbye. And in case you're interested, here are a few references for the sources I used in this presentation. And here are some more. and still more. Finally, here's some information on the Creative Commons license. Thanks again. Goodbye.